Good. It's the last session of the day, right? I think this, you guys have officially survived Ignite. <laughs> Hope you learned a lot and had some fun in the process. I know I did. All right, so this is App Makeover. Basic to beautiful for Power Apps. Uh, so quick agenda for what I'll be covering. Um, I'm gonna talk about something called the Power Apps Design Pyramid. I don't know if any of you here were able to catch my session yesterday um, in the theater. I kind of went over this really fast. So this will be kind of a, an expanded take on that quick theater session that I did the other day. Um, I'm gonna share some tips and tricks and I'll go heavy on the demos in this session and point you to some learning resources. About me, if you haven't, uh, didn't catch my session or haven't heard of me, my name is April Dunham. I'm a Microsoft MVP in Power Apps and Flow. I own a company called ThriveFast. We're a Microsoft partner and we do a lot of SharePoint, Power Apps and Flow, Power Platform consulting. Um, I'm involved in the Power Addicts community, so definitely search on Twitter, hashtag Power Addicts, and learn about all the other people involved in this community. I have an active YouTube channel where I have how-to videos on Power Apps and Flow that you might want to check out, and a blog, SharePointSiren.com, same kind of stuff. And on Twitter, if you want to reach out to me, have any questions, want to follow me, I'm just at April Dunham. All right? Great. Leave on that in a few minutes because I know some people are taking some pictures still there. All right, so when we talk about, you know, what is a beautiful Power App? So to help you kind of understand or get a feel for what a beautiful Power App is, I created something called the Power Apps Design Pyramid. So this is my take on what three components make up a beautiful Power App. So let's start from the bottom up. The foundation to a beautiful Power App is really performance. So I don't know if you guys have got a chance to check out any of the, the other Power App sessions. There are some pretty good ones on performance this week. Um, and performance is really huge because, you know, your Power App can be really beautiful on the outside, but if it's ugly on the inside and it takes five minutes to load, no one is going to want to use it. So that's why performance is such a big deal. So that's the foundation of a beautiful Power App. Building off of that is user experience. So if you have a nice Power App that is really performant, the next step you're going to want to do is make sure that the user experience is really intuitive. You don't want your users to have to have two days of training to learn how to use your Power App. You want it to be easy to learn um, and really intuitive. So we'll go through some tips about how to help with user experience here in this session. And then finally, the icing on the cake is branding. So you have a performant app, your in user experience is really intuitive. Now what bells and whistles can we add to that app to really make it pop? You know, can we, do we have a consistent color scheme? Can we have some great visuals in there and a good design? That's the icing on the cake. So if you remember the acronym PUB, uh, then you'll remember the Power Apps Pyramid and the three things that you wanna watch out for to make sure that you have a nice, beautiful, well-designed Power App. Okay. All right. So diving right in, let's talk about performance first and we'll work our way up. Now, in case you still don't believe me the how important performance is, I wanted to show this interesting study that I came across. So they surveyed a bunch of people and they gave them a list of different things that were stressful. So, you know, ranging from waiting in a line to solving a complex math problem and, and some different things in between. One of those items was experiencing mobile delays. And wouldn't you know it, that is the second most stressful thing that these people could think of in this list that they were given. So that's why performance is so important. It, you're literally stressing out your users if your app is taking forever to load. <laughs> and we don't want that, right? So that's why it's so important. All right, now before we dive into the tips here for performance, I want to make sure that you understand what's happening behind the scenes when your Power App loads. So we're gonna walk through the loading process of all of your Power Apps here. Now the first step when a user tries to open up your app is it has to authenticate because Power Apps runs inside Office 365 in the Power Apps app, so it has to authenticate your user account and make sure that you're a valid user and that you have access to this app. When the authentication is done, the next step, it has to get the metadata. So this is, you know, Power Apps has built-in versioning. I don't know if you guys have 
you made an epic mistake in your Power App and had to revert to a previous version. So we're definitely thankful, I know I have, uh, for that versioning built in. But part of the loading process, it has to look and see what your most recent version is and make sure it's pulling down that version to show to your user. At this point also, it needs to look at the data sources that you're using in your application and pull all those down. So a common performance impact that you'll see is you'll have you know, 80 data sources in your Power App. Those all have to be loaded before the first screen is even shown to your user. So that's a big performance hit that I see a lot. So at that point, you're probably better off splitting up your app into multiple if you're getting to where you really need 80 data sources. You know, spit it, spit it out into different applications and don't try to create one app to, you know, one monolithic app to do everything. Okay, so we have did two things already. Our app isn't even loaded to our user yet. The next thing is to run the onStart code. So I don't know, show of hands, have any of you put any code in the onStart so you clicked on the app? Okay, so all that code that you put in there has to run before the first screen's rendered. So this is another huge performance impact, right? If you have, you're loading 50 the data sources to populate different things in your app, those all have to run and load before the screen is rendered. So optimization on this onStart is key. And then finally, the very last thing is these screens are rendered. Now the default behavior for this is whatever you have set as the first screen, so in the Power Apps, whatever screen is at top, that's your first screen, that's the one that will be rendered. However, there's some caveats to that, which I'll share in my tips here, um, that can you can actually have some things going on where you force the app to have to load multiple screens, which slows down your performance. So we'll talk about that and see ways around that and how to get around that. All right, tips time. That's what we all came here for. So I'm gonna talk through these tips and then I'm gonna go into some demos. So for performance, the first big tip, cache data when possible. This is huge. So every time you're wanting to populate a gallery, for example, or pull information down from your data source, that has to make a call to your data source and pull it down. So maybe you have three different galleries, you know, like a nested gallery situation in your Power App, and you need to call three different data sources. That's a call each time. When you navigate away from the screen that that's on and back, that's another call. So in cases where you have data that's going to be remain fairly static throughout, the, um, throughout your app, the, uh, the session of your app, then you wanna cache that data. So caching just means loading it ahead of time into a collection. Anyone here has used collections in Power Apps? Okay. So that's what we can do um, to cache your data is use these collections. And I'll show you some demos that here in a second. The next tip is to load data simultaneously. So in Power Apps, when you're performing different actions, like maybe you're loading things into a collection and you're doing multiple ones of those, um, that runs sequentially. So you know I'm pulling data from this SharePoint list and then I wanna pull some data from another one and on and on. Well, that, the first one has to load, then the second one, and then the third, so it's sequential. There's something that you can use called the concurrent function which will enable you to load all those things at the same time, and that really can have a big performance impact. So we'll look at that here too in a second. Uh, the next, eliminate screen dependencies. So this is what I talked about in that loading process, how sometimes you're, you're doing some patterns in your app that's creating a dependency in screens um, that causes performance impact, so we'll show how to reduce that. And finally, don't repeat the same formula. So if there's something that you want to do in your application and that formula is the same for multiple controls, you don't have to repeat that. I'll show you a trick for getting around that. All right, now let's go to the demos here. All right, great. So let's talk about caching first. So here I have my product ordering Power App that I built. And there's several different lists that I need to pull. First, I need to pull a list of categories like we're seeing here. So you can select the category that you want to choose. And then I need to pull the products down. So in this app on start, so that's where you'll go to put your on start code that we looked at there. Let me zoom in real quick. Whoa, that was a lot. <laughs> All right, um, a little bit more, there we go. Oh my gosh, I'll just leave it like that. Um, I'm using that collection that we talked about earlier, right? So I have, in this case, my data source is a SharePoint list. 
So I want to pull those categories to show on this first screen. So I'm putting that into a collection here called product categories. And then after that, I need to pull the products that I want to show. So I have another SharePoint list called products, and I'm putting that into a collection that I'm calling product listings, and I'm just doing some mappings here with my data source. So right now, both of these have to run uh, sequentially. So first I have to get my products categories, and then I'll get the products. Now if you have a lot of you know, thousands of records in this, that's gonna take a while to pull down. So let's talk about that caching or that collection thing first. So if I don't wanna have these run sequentially, I can simply come into the formula bar and type in concurrent and an open parenthesis, and I can wrap both of these calls in that concurrent function. Um, and you might notice, um, if you haven't used concurrent before, I have all these red squigglies, so why is that? Because um, in the concurrent, you need to separate your formulas in with a comma and not a semicolon. So you know normally you separate everything with a semicolon, but if you're wrapping stuff inside the concurrent, you'll wanna change that to a comma to separate that, and that will get rid of that big squiggly error message that you see there. Um, so now, this is optimized because these are both going to be pulling at the same time. Now obviously, um, if there was some kind of dependency, like maybe I was pre-filtering this product listing based on something, you know, the action above, this concurrent call is not gonna work because these are literally running in parallel. It's getting the products the same time it's getting the categories. So if there's a dependency there, you'll, it'll get a big error in your application because hey, you're trying to pull this, but there's a dependency and it hasn't been pulled yet, right? So just something to watch out for when you're using this concurrent. Um, Obviously with this though, um, be careful because there is a point of diminishing returns here. You try to put too many calls into a concurrent, it'll actually have the opposite effect um, and slow down your application. So you just wanna be careful um, and there's no you know, true like, oh yeah, don't put more than 30 calls in a concurrent. It really depends on what you're trying to do. Like if, are, you, are you trying to pull you know, 50,000 items worth of records in one? Yeah, that's probably not good. So you'll just have to play around with it and, and watch the performance impact. And a tip there, um, have you guys been to the sessions where they talked about the new performance monitor capability in Power Apps? Okay, so that's what will really help you in this situation when you're trying to optimize your application and putting stuff in this concurrent function. Look at the performance monitor and see, you know, am I getting a performance increase and, and add, just slowly add one piece into the current concurrent function until, you know, you're optimized enough for, so that's one thing there. Uh, okay, the next tip is the caching tip. So let's look at product categories, for example. My categories in here throughout the state of the app are never gonna change, right? I mean, chances are someone adding a new category while I'm in here trying to order something are very low. So that's a good opportunity for me to cache this data. So um, by caching, I mean in this gallery, I could have pointed it directly to my data source which is just categories. That's my SharePoint list, and that's fine, and I could do that. But like I said, every time I come to the screen and load the application, it has to make that call. Well, since my categories don't change, that's why on my app on start here, I'm putting that into a collection because those values are never gonna stay, change, and so now in my gallery, I can just point that gallery to this product categories collection, and it's cached, and I don't have to make any unnecessary data calls. All right, next let's talk about the screen dependencies because this is a big one. I've uh, helped clients all around with Power Apps and I think this is by far one of the biggest impacts that I've seen from a performance standpoint. Um, all right, so a good example of this is I have this categories list and when I select one, let's go into hand protection for example, this is filtering the second gallery on this screen to only show the products of that category. So what you'll see a lot of people do in this scenario to make this happen is on the, the gallery for the categories here, so I have my products and the items, you'll see a filter like this. So I'm filtering my products list and I'm saying where category equals the selected item in my category category gallery there, right? Now, yeah, that's, it makes sense, right? That's an intuitive way to do it, it seems right. But the problem is, I've just created a dependency now. 
So because the gallery here for my products is dependent on whatever I selected on that gallery in the previous screen, now both of these screens have to render before the app loads. And this can have a nested effect, right? You can see how this easily trickle down. So now I could create another dependency where I select a product and maybe I'm going to a product detail screen and I'm doing that same concept like for these gloves here where I'm filtering this based on what I selected in the product. So now three screens have to load. So this can easily get out of hand. So what we can do to get around that, let me go back here, is we can offload that so we're not creating that nested screen dependency. So here on my gallery, if you go to the drop down and the on select, I can use that collection again and I can create a collection of filtered products. So I can say filtered products and I can do the filtering at this level and where the category equals whatever I have selected here. And then now back on my category uh, browse screen with my products, I can point that data source, if I go back here to the drop down and the items, I can point that to the, let's just get rid of this bad code with my dependencies here and let's use what I have commented out so we can see the good code. There we go. So I can point it to the filtered products instead and I can even do some sorting and everything at this level. So now I've eliminated that dependency because I did that on the on select of my category and that's what I'm using here in my items for this gallery, right? All right, so then the last performance tip here I'm gonna leave you with in the demo is the don't repeat the same formulas. So this is another big one. So I'm gonna to switch to a different app actually. Let's see, let's go to this new screen. So this is a common one I'll see. So in this form, I have some yes or no options, right? So ideally, if I choose yes on this question, if this vendor is bonded, then I want these to show. I don't want these two options to show unless I click, click yes here. Same thing for the insured. Unless I click yes, I don't want these two to show. So what will you do in this situation? Let's go to these different fields that we wanna show or hide based on that radio button and we'll go to the visible property, right? And we'll probably use a formula something like this. So we'll do an if statement and we'll point it to our data card with our drop down, which in this case is this data card key 21 or 14, sorry. And we'll just say if that data card value is true, then set the value of this to true. If not, false, right? Pretty simple. And then we'll, okay, we want to do the same thing for year bonded, right? So we'll just go into that and we'll say, all right, use that same formula. You know, nothing wrong with that, but now that's another call it has to make. It has to check that twice now. Now you can see if you're doing this and like, I want to show 50 different fields, if I click yes or no, that's going to be a lot of different calls um, and it's going to affect my performance. So what can you do instead? You might have guessed it. It's this last commented out piece here. I can just reference, I can do it on one of those fields, right? So my bonded by, I can put my if statement, I can do that. And now if I know I have 20 other fields that need that same logic, I can just say, hey, take whatever that first field is, this bonded by data card value, check its visibility, and that's what I want the visibility of this data card to be. So now it's just one call to check that radio button and you just repeat it. And then it's also great from a maintainability, right? So if I wanna change that formula for any reason and I have 20, I'm gonna to have to touch each one, right? That's, that's a pain, we all know that is. So now I only have to change it on one spot and it will be applied to every different data card that I'm using this in. So it has a dual benefit here for performance and for, for you guys to help you maintain your apps. All right, great. So let's switch back to the slides here real quick. All right, let's get, let's get to the fun stuff. I know performance can be a little snooze fest, but it is important. Um, so let's talk about user experience though. <laughs> um, all right, so when I talk about user experience, what I'm really talking about here is 
How can you make your app easy to use? Again, you don't want to have to have your users spend two days of training to use your application, right? Um, and how do you make it accessible? This is another big one. Um, you know, you have issues like colorblindness and things like that. You want to make sure that you're optimizing your application so that's accessible for everybody. Um, efficient, effective, and engaging. These are all parts of user experience that you want to make sure you're touching on when you're building your Power Apps. So let's dive into the tips then. First one, um, and this is a big one, keep users informed of, with loading and success messages. So, you know, going back to the performance, right? I mean, we want to optimize our apps as much as we can, but there's going to be some things that are just going to take a little bit of time, right? Maybe you're, you know, patching to a data source and it's just a time consuming process, right? And you've optimized it as much as you can. The key here then is to just communicate to your user. So if they're submitting something, I mean, show a message, just like, you know, submitting your information, just a simple message, or maybe you're loading thousands of records and it's just gonna take a little bit. Show a nice little, you know, spinning loading message just so they know that, hey, okay, the app's working, it's just doing something. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as getting a GIF or GIF, whatever you wanna say it is, um, and putting it in your application and loading it um, before your function is called and then hiding it after. Um, success messages are big too. Like I, I see a lot of people build apps and you know, they submit an item and it just takes them back to the homepage. Well, how does your user know that their item was successfully added? You know, they just kind of have to hope that it was, right? Um, so just show like a simple confirmation message goes a long way to you know, ease your, your user's minds that the app is functioning as it should. All right, the next, if you were in my session yesterday, um, this is still another big one, uh, Marie Kondo, your apps. So to me, this is really huge. Clutter is the enemy of good design. Uh, hopefully, do you guys know who Marie Kondo is? Right, okay. So she's, you know, if it doesn't spark joy, and toss it, that's her big thing. She's on Netflix and has a show about reducing clutter. So that same concept applies to your Power Apps. You don't want your users to have to search everywhere to figure out what they're gonna do and be overwhelmed by all this information. Because, you know, there's only so much cognitive load that we can take at one time looking at a screen. So we want to optimize that and reduce it as much as possible. And again, be mindful of accessibility. This is huge. Um, and thankfully, Power Apps offers some accessibility tools that kind of give you some tips and, uh, and are aware of like what you can do for accessibility, which we'll look at here in a second. Uh, choose visuals over text. A picture is really worth a thousand words. So anywhere that you know, you're trying to communicate something to your user, like maybe, hey, you have 10 hours left of vacation time. Well, can you not put that in some kind of nice graphic, like maybe a donut chart so they can visually see, like I've used 10 out of 20? Um, any way that you can use these visuals um, is going to help because that really helps clean up and makes your app more intuitive. And then finally, uh, leverage native device functionality. So when you're designing your applications, you want to make sure you understand your user and who's going to be using this app. Is this going to be primarily used on desktop by you know, your marketing department? Or is it going to be used on your mobile phone for your field employees? So if it's going to be used on your mobile phone, for example, um, you want to make sure if you're linking off to something like maybe uh, you know, directions for somewhere, you don't want to have that open up in the browser, right? You want it to open up in the native mobile device. So I'll show you a tip on how you can do that with Empower Apps. Great, more demos. Let's go into some UX stuff now. All right, so success message. Let's start with that and the uh, loading message, that's the easiest one to do. So first tip I'm gonna give you, if you wanna get some cool uh, loading messages, go to this site called loading, L-O-A-D-I-N-G dot I-O. Some of you probably heard of this before, I know a lot of people kind of promote this, but you can go here and click on spinner, and they actually have hundreds of different spinner icons, like this one for example, that you can get and download and use in your app. So just, it's all free. Some of them are, are um, paid for, um, depending on what they are. Some, like there's an hourglass one, but like I really love the Pac-Man one, that's pretty cool to show a learning message. Um, so you just literally click on it and download it, and then we can import that into our app. So I've downloaded one of these, this blocks one. So if you wanna use this to show a loading message in your app, just go to your app and to add that as an image. So you can do that by clicking view up here 
and going to media and browsing and just uploading that here. So you can see I already have it loading here and it even shows in the preview that it is a GIF and that it's spinning. So now how do I use this in my app to show a loading message? So in my case, uh, when my app is initially loaded on the app on start, this is the same app we looked at earlier, I'm doing a few things. I'm pulling some data. So this will take a little bit of time. So I want to make sure that my user knows that, hey, it's just pulling some data here. So what I can do is on my first screen, and again, your first screen that loads is whatever screen you have at the very top of your app, I can just insert a image control. So you just go to insert media and image, which I've already did. And I have this image here, which is hidden right now, and just set the image property to that image you uploaded. In this case, it's that blocks image. So now we want to basically show or hide this loading image um, before, we want to show it before my formulas um, execute, and then we want to hide it after. So what we can do is, in that app on start where all of that stuff is happening, that's going to take a little bit, I can just use a global variable. So I can say set, and that's how you define a variable in Power Apps, show loading to true. So the first thing that I'm going to do before I do my collection or any of my other logic is set that to true so that this thing shows. And then I'm going to execute all of my different logic. And then after it's all done, I'm just going to do that same set. And I'm going to set that same variable back to false. So now you're probably catching on. The only thing left to do is go to that loading image that I uploaded on here. And let's go to its visible property. And we'll just set its visibility to that variable. So the visibility, as you know, is a true or false. It's a Boolean. So now, if I actually play this app as an end user, let's open up the store here, you'll see that now there's an initial loading message. This is the native Power Apps one. Um, whoops, wrong app. <laughs> Too click happy there. Store. So that's the initial loading message. But then I have, that, there's my custom spinning block loading message. Because my screen was rendered, but I had to pull down that data. So that's my custom loading message. So pretty straightforward. No, that's not rocket science there. You can apply that same concept again. Like if you're submitting something, you know that's going to take a while. Um, just on the button click, set that same variable. And then set the visibility of your loading message to that. And it'll show and hide. Now let's talk about the success message. Now this one's pretty straightforward again. Um, after your user has submitted something, I, the easiest way is just to put in a success screen. And Power Apps makes that really easy because if you've ever clicked the new screen button up here, you might have noticed that there is a template for success. So I usually just use that. Um, it's a good placeholder and place to start. You can insert one of those, and it just gives you a nice little icon with a check mark and a label. So you can customize the label however you want. You know, like, so in my case, this is an order management thing. So I can say, you know, your order was successfully submitted, right? And then uh, one little trick that I like to do to expand on this, though, instead of just showing that and making them click back, I actually like to use a timer control and have it, you know, show the message for two seconds, and then automatically route them back to where I want to go. So I'll show you that tip real quick here. So I actually have a timer here on my success screen, but I just have it hidden. So have, have you guys used the timer control? Kind of familiar with it? So this is, um, if you've ever seen the cool like games that people have built in Power Apps on Twitter, they're using the timer control a lot for this. So that's used for that a lot. Um, but what you can do is insert the timer. And all you have to do is give it a duration. So in this case, I'm, I'm doing five seconds, right? Um, so I want it to auto start. So that means when this success screen is loaded, this timer will automatically kick off. And what you can do is on when the timer ends, so if you click on the timer itself and click the drop down, you'll see an option for on timer end, right? So if we go there, we can literally just say, OK, the five seconds is up, the timer's ending, now we want to navigate back to the home page. So that way, again, you're reducing clicks, because that's another thing for user experience. You want to reduce the amount of clicks that your user has to take. So this is kind of doing that. You get the confirmation, but you get routed back. Right? All right. Let's talk about clutter next. Right? So for the clutter thing, I'm going to go back here to that vendor management app that we were just looking at. 
So I have a, a vendor management good and a vendor management bad. This is my bad one. They kind of look the same on, on this screen, but it's really when you go to the form. So when I think about clutter, the most common example of this I see is when you are, have a form and you're trying to get data from people. Um, so you have, say, uh, 200 data inputs that you need to take, maybe in this case. Um, and I'll, you'll just put in a form control and then you have, your user has to scroll through 200 fields to fill out all of that information. That's cluttered, that's not intuitive, that's, your users are gonna hate you, they don't know, is this form ever ending? Please, God help me. Um, <laughs> so what, how can we get around that, right? So my suggestion is, let's go to my good app, break it out into reasonable chunks. So what you can do is, in this case, I'm utilizing a component, and if you haven't used components, it's just a way to create a reusable control that you can use throughout your application. So I can put a component in here, and I can show a visual indicator of the progress. So I know for this form, there's four steps. And I know right now I'm on step one, and I'm breaking this out into reasonable chunks. So the first chunk is just your basic information, your name and your mailing address. So I can fill out this information here. Don't mind my typing, I'm just going fast. And then I can click next through the process. And as I complete that step, I get a visual indicator, a green check mark that that was done. Now I'm on this step. No scrolling here, that's the key, right? I'm breaking out into chunks where I can just see it on the screen, fill out all of that information. Next, another check mark. And this is another one too that I think is a great tip. Um, I cannot remember who, but I think it was on one of our Power Addicts calls where um, he was saying, you know, you can have a drop down, right? And so in this case, for legal structure, this could easily just be a normal drop down where I click it and I define if it's a corporation or not. But if you want a more intuitive experience, change those drop downs to buttons instead. So if you have, you know, just a few options, like five at the most probably, like in this case, right? You can put those as buttons instead and it's way more intuitive and visually appealing for our users than having to click on a drop down, right? So I can go in here and select that the legal structure is an LLC. I just highlight it in blue so I know that's what's selected and if I wanna change it. Uh, so that's another easy way to kind of break down your form and make it more intuitive for your user. Let me just fill that out here. And you get to the final step here, fill out your information and now you can save it. So what's happening here, just behind the scenes, um, these are just multiple form controls in this case, that's the easiest way just to get data on here. So as I click next, I'm just saving, and then I'm just saving onto the, updating the last form that was submitted. So now I can save this record, my, get my success screen again, following my practice with the timer, and I'm navigated back to my homepage, and I see my new vendor here on the screen. Yes? Yeah, good question. So he's asking, was I saving that data um, on each form as I went along, or was it kind of caching it and saving at once? Um, in this case, I am caching it, so, uh, um, and I'm just doing a one save at the very end. So I'm just putting that into a local collection, and then um, when that save button is clicked, it's saving all of that collection information in a patch statement. But you could do it in multiple form controls and just have it update the record too. So it's really up to you. Um, it Probably caching it and doing one big patch um, might be easier, because um, you don't want to, uh, if you're doing multiple and you got interrupted in the process, it might cause some issues, so. Good question. Okay. So hopefully that gives you an idea of how you can start breaking up and decluttering your apps. Now let's talk about accessibility. So you might have noticed in the same application, when I was adding a new item, I had these red outlines on my text boxes. Now, I'm trying to be helpful here and communicate to my user that these are required fields, right? So, hey, you haven't filled out your name, um, so I'm putting it in red, right? And it goes away as I fill it out. The problem with this is it's not accessible. If I have someone that is suffering from colorblindness, they're not going to see that red box. They're not gonna know that this is a required field. So what's another alternative that I can use to get around this? Well, instead, let's click out of here. I can use icons, because everyone can understand and see what an icon means. So if you go to insert here, and icons, you'll see all these different icons here to choose from. So you know, if the information is filled out, I might want to show a check mark, for example, so I can put one of those in. 
which I have here. Let me just make that visible. Um, but if it's not filled out, maybe I want to show uh, an X, like a cancel kind of icon. So what I can do is I can insert one of those icons, and I can use a formula to dynamically change which icon is shown based on if that data is empty or not. So if you add an icon into here, like I did, click on the drop down and go to the icon property, you'll see that I'm just using a really simple formula here. So this icon switching was something that was only added about, I don't know, maybe six months ago or something like that, so it's relatively new. Um, so I can just use the isBlank function, and I can put in my data card. So in this case, it's the vendor name right there. So I can say, if that is blank, then I want to show the cancel icon. But if it's not, show the checkmark icon. And I can mix and match. So for the people that you know, don't suffer from color blindness, I can even like, make the check mark green and the cancel icon red. You know? But as long as I have an icon that's a visual indicator besides just a red box, that's going to be accessible for my users. Okay? So let's just run this and see how that works. Now I put these icons in each of my different uh, data cards so that, that are required. So if I just make these visible again, now you'll see I have an X that those two aren't filled out. So now as I fill out the mailing address and tab out of that, I get a check mark so I know that I've did my job, I've completed it, and nice accessible visual indicators to my users. Um, another tip for accessibility. If you go to your Power App and you click on this little button here, the App Checker button, you'll see um, not only does this App Checker help you, you know, debug your formulas and find any errors or issues, but you'll see an accessibility option here. So if you expand that out, it's going to tell you everything that you need to do to make your Power App accessible. So in my case, I actually have 44 errors. That's not, that's not really great, right? I probably want to go through and really make this accessible. So for example, I'm missing labels. That's another big thing for accessibility. So for these icons, you want to go in and add an accessible label that this is, you know, um, icon for hamburger menu or whatever. So you can literally click in to each of these and it'll take you right to the object that you need to make accessible and then fill in the required information. So this is going to be your one-stop shop to make sure that your applications are accessible. All right. So let's talk about visuals over text next. This is one of my favorites. So let's go here. So here I have a time away application. Now, I could have just had some text on here that, hey, you have 15 days available, right? And that would have been fine, but isn't this way more visually appealing, having a donut to where I can see, okay, that's how much I've used out of my available time off, so what's filled out in pink there is the used, and what's in gray is the remaining. That's way more visually appealing. So this is something you can do with an SVG, which is just a scalable vector graphic. And it's just a fancy picture is really all it is. And you can put in some um, pass-in parameters from your app into this SVG, and it'll fill in the bar chart. Now, um, I've tried to make this as easy as possible for you guys. I actually have this code for this donut thing on my GitHub, which I'll, I'll share in the slides later on. So all you have to do is plug that into your application and put in your different values and use it. But I'll go through how it works real quickly here. So if we recall back to that loading.io site that I talked about earlier, not only can you get those loading messages, but you can get SVGs to use. So if I wanted to fill in a bar chart, I could go here, download one, and copy that SVG code. Now in my application, if I go back here, to use the SVG, I just need to insert an image control again, just like we did with the GIF. So I can go insert, media, an image. Now the only difference is I'm not actually uploading an image. I'm going to put in a big block of text here. So if I expand out the image property, it's not too bad. I actually have all this SVG code. So this is actually what builds the image here. And this you can get this um, automatically from that website and just copy that code and paste it here into your app. Um, the important thing to make it work in your application, though, um, you might see I have some text at the top, like data, image, SVG, and then I'm doing a, an ampersand, an encode URL. You need to wrap your SVG code in that encode URL for it to work. And again, there's a sample out there, so you can just copy and paste this into your application. And now you'll see I am taking 
the code and I'm putting in some values from my power up in here. So if you look at these ampersands, so I'm taking whatever my balance is, so this item balance, I'm dividing it by total time that I have for this item in the gallery, and I'm multiplying that by 100. And then for the remaining, I'm doing the balance and then multiplying it by 100 there. So I'm just doing a simple math formula, passing that in from data in my gallery, and it's filling in those bar charts for me, that donut bar there. Um, you can read all about SVGs if you want to really get more into it, but it uses what's called uh, dash arrays to do the filling in of, of the, the data there. Um, but again, this is out there on GitHub, so you can just copy it and paste this into your application. And the only thing you need to do is replace this with whatever values that you're wanting to fill in. Okay. Uh, some other ideas for what you can do um, with visuals and SVGs, um, this is that demo app that you can get from my GitHub here. So we showed that um, another cool one is a fundraiser. So you know, I've created this as a component, actually, that you could download. Um, so maybe you are you know, doing a fundraiser for the United Way. Um, so you want to show your progress in your application. So you can set your goal here. So maybe it's you know, 5,000. And then you can set the current amount raised. And you can even do things like animate your SVGs. So I don't know if you noticed it, because it was pretty quick. But as I put in the current value, it kind of filled up the thermometer. So this is just something possible, uh, again, with that timer control. So I remember how I said you've seen those cool um, animations and stuff that people do with power apps? That's done with the timer. So this is just another SVG, but I'm, and I'm passing in data from my power app. And I'm just using this timer control to automatically change the value as it moves up. Um, this sample is also out there, so you can just plug it and use it in your application as well. All right. And let's talk about native device functionality next. This is another pretty cool one. Let's go to this people. So a good use case for this is, I want to build a Power App so I can uh, see all the people in my organization, right? Um, people directory. Uh, when I load this on my mobile application, though, I want to be able to click and go into this particular person's LinkedIn profile, uh, Twitter, and YouTube. Now, if I'm on my mobile device, I probably already have those applications installed, right? Now, have you guys used the launch command in your apps to open up like other links? OK, right? When you do that and you put in the hyperlink, it only opens it up in the browser. But I don't want that to happen. I want this to open up in the actual LinkedIn application or the Twitter application on my phone or YouTube. How can we do that? And this, again, I have a video on this and a uh, blog that actually walks through this. So if we run out of time, you can always reference that later on. Um, so again, here's the launch command for YouTube, for example. If I put it in like we see there on top with just the HTTP, that's going to open it up in the browser, not the YouTube application. But what I can do here instead is use that command, the YouTube with the colon, whack, whack, and then my channel name, and that'll actually tell it to open up in the mobile application. So I put together a few of these different examples of things you might want to upload in my blog post and video for you to look at. Um, so definitely check that out. So this makes it much more intuitive for a user, right, using their native applications instead of directing them to the browser instead. OK. So that was the last tip there. Switch back to the slides real quick for our very last piece of our pyramid. And that is branding. All right, this is the icing on the cake, remember? So when I talk about branding, I mean, you know, how do you define a good color scheme, typography, and images in your application? And the one big tip that I want to leave you with here for branding, um, well, a few things, but one is to use your company brand standard. So pretty much any company that I've ever worked with has some kind of big PDF document that their marketing department put together that says, hey, here's our company logo, here are our company color codes and our typography and all that. When you're building a Power App, take that brand standard and use it in your application. And what I like to do is to create a branding screen for my application so that I know what my brand standard is. I don't have to open up that PDF every time, and I can use that throughout my application, right? So let's just dive in again to the demo and show you this branding screen in action, because I think it's pretty useful. So I'm actually using that here in my store app. So you'll see I have a screen called settings. So what I did here, let me just expand this out, is I took that brand standard, and I knew that I had all these different colors for my, in my brand standard. So I put in a rectangle control, and I filled it in with the color for my brand standard. 
And I just put in some labels that, hey, this is our blue color, and that's the hex code. So now, everywhere through my app where I want to use those colors, I can just reference them from this screen. Uh, same thing with the fonts and stuff, and there's my company logo. So I have a one-stop shop where I know what my company's brand is to use on my app. So what I can do is on my app on start, I can create basically almost like a CSS for my Power App. Do you guys know what CSS is? It's just like a style sheet, right, to, for, for your application? So I'm, you can do that using, again, that collection. So I'm creating a theme collection, and I'm just mapping some keys. So for maybe for the focus border of your text input boxes, I want those to be blue. Well, what I'm doing is I'm mapping that to that rectangle control that has my blue value, and I'm getting the fill of that. So now I can go to my settings screen here, and I can change this. Any, if my brand ever changes, all I got to do is change this fill color, and now anywhere I'm using that, if I'm using my theme, it's going to get updated. I don't have to touch 50 screens and change the blue manually everywhere. Okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so again, just create your mapping, uh, fill it with your colors, and now you have an easy-to-use branding screen. And I think that is about time. That's what I wanted to leave you with. Let me switch back to the slides real quick. All right. And yeah, just some resources I'll, I'll leave you with here. Um, if you want to learn more about optimization, there's a great blog Microsoft put together where they have all the techniques that I showed today, plus more. Uh, components, they have a GitHub where you can download a bunch of examples of components to use in your applications. Again, that site there for free GIFs and SVGs. Um, I didn't touch on image compression, but that's another big thing for performance and branding. Compressor images, they take a long time to load. They can slow down performance. And that's a website that'll do it for you. Uh, design inspiration, there's a cool site called UI Movement where you can look and get examples of cool designs for your apps. Uh, that's my GitHub where you can download the SVG demos and a bunch of other kind of power apps that I've built. My YouTube, my blog, follow Power Addicts on Twitter, and that is all that I have for you guys. Thank you very much. <laughs>